Welcome everybody to Sunday night webinar. Tonight, Gillian Pry is going to talk about being a contest chair. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you very much, John. And thank you for, for already setting up the scene for my presentation. And we all have contests coming up very soon. Some districts have already started. I actually was a judge recently in a district I won't mention. But I hope that this evening I can answer some of your questions. And if not, I will certainly be able to point you in the right direction to get them answered. And could I just have some sort of um, information in the chat or hands up? Have you ever been a contest chair before? Hands up if you've done it before. I can see a few hands going up. Perfect. Okay, so you'll be giving me the intelligent questions that I may not be able to answer, but I will do my very best. But um, what I'd also like you to tell me is, what are you hoping to get out of this webinar? Put that in the chat, that would be helpful. Just a few words. Apart from the pleasure of our company. So as John has said, the scope of the presentation is that we're just looking at the contest chair. I know that very often the contest chair is also the person who organizes the contest. And I've done that role many times as well. So I may be able to answer questions on that, but I'm gonna focus on the actual contest chair. And I also try and put it in context with the other roles in the contest. So why do we hold contests? Let's have some ideas from you all. Why, why do you think, what, what is the purpose of a contest? Just a few words in the chat. Upping your game. I like that one. A new challenge. Development. Challenge. Good experience. I like that one as well. How other clubs work. Fun. Yes. Someone said it. Fun. Pearl. Well done. Yes. Why not? That's what it's all about, isn't it? Enjoying yourself and being together with our fellow Toastmasters and learning as all of our Toastmasters experiences, reaching out, other Toastmasters clubs, healthy competition, brilliant. <laughs> Marta's still got the music going on, John. I don't know what that's about. Okay, that's brilliant. I, I love those responses. Um, so let's have a look at my little list. I will take you through my agenda, first of all. So welcome. Who's involved in running a, con in, in the running a contest, basically? What does the contest chair do? What resources are there available? A little quiz later on, on some of the contest rules. I can't go through very much of it, but we'll have a little quiz. Common issues, things that could come up and questions at the end. And I'm definitely looking for ideas from the people who've already done this job, your experience to help me along the way. So, who's involved in a contest? So there's two main people, aren't there? We've got the contest chair running one side of the contest, and we've got the chief judge on the other side. And I've tried to do a little bit of color coding here so that you can see 
who's responsible for what. And we have the Zoom host who's sort of sitting alongside them. I'm only looking at Zoom contests because that's mainly what we're running at the moment, or perhaps I should say online contests if you're running in a different platform. But the contest chair is responsible for those people on the left-hand side. So you've got your contestants, obviously, if you've got your contest sergeant at arms who is looking after the contestants when they need to move out of the room for any reason. If we're running an evaluation contest, we have a test speaker. And the chief judge is looking after the judges, the ballot counters and the timers. But the timers are also very visible in the contest itself. So you, the contest chair, will also need to be in close contact with them. So these little lines show my idea of who needs to speak to who, who is responsible to whom. But I'm sure you'll think of something else. You'll think of a few more lines there. Let's move on. What does the contest chair do? Communications, that's a really big thing. And you need to set up your lines of communication early. You need a list of everyone who's taking part in the contest. Who are the participants? With their roles, their contact details, your links. You might set up a WhatsApp group. That's a really good way of keeping in touch with everyone before and during the contest. Some people don't like WhatsApp, so you might have to email them. In fact, email is also another great way of keeping in touch, especially if you need to send out lots of documents. You can just attach them to all to the same email and send them out all of you. Well, you might like to send an example of the voting form so that the contestants are aware of what criteria they're being judged on. You'll need to send the form that where they can sign up for their eligibility and originality of their speech. All the different forms that go out. And you need to keep everybody informed. You just need to be in good, close contact with everyone in the, in the contest. And the contest organiser, if that's not yourself, they might like to get together with yourself and the chief judge and the Zoom host before the contest to iron out any little problems that might occur to be absolutely aware of what's going on. And you can really make the contest work well if you have that little get together beforehand. The contest chair briefs the contestants. You'll email them all the details of what they need to know. And if I can advise you, I think a pre-briefing before the actual contest is a great way. Hold a little get together, an online meeting where you can tell them all about the rules, you can answer their questions, you can agree the speaking area, you can determine the order of speaking. There's a little list of all these things which we can find on the District 91 website, which I'll tell you about in a little while. But yes, you br brief all the contestants and you will expect to get back from them their signed forms for eligibility and originality well before the contest happens. You're also responsible for the contest sergeant at arms, who we would in our club refer to as the usher, the person who helps the speakers, uh, who sees them in and out of the room, who might accompany them into the breakout room and make sure that they don't cheat, basically. So that person really needs to understand their job. You're also responsible for the target speaker. And that person, they might be very nervous when they turn up to do their speech. And one good idea is to put them in their own separate breakout room so you can go and have a chat with them before the contest starts. Make sure that they know what's happening. And 
that everything is going to run fine. You choose the table topic, or I like to anyway. That's always fun if you're running a topics contest. And you, you're the host when it comes to the actual contest. You're in charge of the contest alongside of the chief judge. The two of you are in charge of that contest on the night. You need to treat all the contestants equally. It can be very fair. And you need to know and keep to the rules. On the night happens. You have a script and hopefully you've rehearsed it. And there are examples of scripts on the District 91 website, but I always have my own script. I fill in all the names because I've already found out what the order of the contestants is. Or I try to have it all ready. As much as you can have ready before the night, have it ready because it makes life so much easier. And there's always something that happens, something untoward, someone drops out, someone has a question, problems. Deal with all the things you can deal with ahead of time. Be there early and you can do any briefings that haven't yet been done. You can do technical checks with the people who are taking part. The contestants make sure that you can see and hear them clearly and that they understand what's going on. You can welcome the target speaker into their little breakout room. When the contest starts, you do the introductions and you could have some personal touches. I've seen some really nice things done here. We had one lady who actually gave us relaxation exercises before the contest started just for a few minutes and it could have made the difference. You never know. It's about people and contestants get so nervous when you see them in that briefing room. Part of your job is to try and put people at ease. And Pearl knows all about that. We did it together the last contest. Then when you actually get into the contest, you get the formal bit. You have to read the rules and there's the contest itself. And the format of the contest is actually laid down in the contest rule book. It's very precise that the wording that you are allowed to use is very precise and you will have that in your script so that you don't diverge from it. It's all about being fair to everybody, not making a distinction between the different contestants. So you've gone through the contest, everybody's got through it happily. Afterwards, while the judges are busy, you need to fill in some time. So you will be presenting participant certificates. You will be finding things for everybody to do. You might decide to go off for a break because everybody deserves a break. And while we're all having the break, you might consider that the judges are busy and you might try and get your timing right so that even the judges will be getting a break because I've had a few complaints about that one in the past. I'm just passing that on for your benefit. Judges might be busy while everyone else is having their cup of tea. You might have table topics to fill in. Fill in and it's always a good idea to have a few activities ready to keep people busy. Because sometimes all that totting up of scores can take a long time. But you are like the contest Toastmaster in a way. You're the person who's dealing with the timing. Resources. Here we are, we've got two main sources that I use to get my information from. We all need to be very familiar with the contest rule book. And I can put this in the chat later on. 
this link, but it's on the toastmasters.org website. It's not that hard to find. And at the end of the contest rule book, there is a comprehensive checklist of responsibilities for the contest chair. Let's have a very quick look at the contest rule book. I can manage to find it. And while Gillian is finding it, can I just give you a piece of internet advice? Always make sure the rule book you are using is the one from Toastmasters International. It's not a rule book being copied onto some district website somewhere else. You want to go to the source of the original data. Don't go to somebody else's because there's a chance that it will be an old version, an edited version, um, a redacted version, and therefore you won't have the right rules. So please always go back to the district Sorry, not your district, but to the main Toastmasters version. Thank you, John. That's a very good point. So, I mean, this is a very long and complicated piece of writing, but it does give you all the rules which you can go back to when you need to. Eligibility is a complicated area. And if you're not sure, get advice. If you don't know and you've talked it through with the people you think ought to know, you can always go to the district chief judge who is very happy to give us good advice. And it talks about what takes part in the actual contest. Things that could go wrong, protests and disqualifications. Rules for each of the contests and the general procedure, how each contest takes part, takes place. And they've added a little bit for online contests, but there are separate um, pieces of advice for online contests as well. And there is actually a contest chairs checklist in here, but I would um, give you the note that this actually includes quite a lot of the activities that would I would put under the heading of organizing the contest. So you might have a contest organizer who's doing these things. Very often I am that contest organizer as well as being the contest chair. And it, it, the two roles do fit quite neatly alongside each other because when you're the contest chair, you're the person who's up there facing the music. You want to make sure that everything's going right, that there's no gaps. But occasionally, if you trust the person who is organizing it, it, it can work quite nicely that you are just the contest chair. Checklists for all of these things, and it, it talks about briefing, but we have more on the District 91 website on briefings. Let me swap that share back. So the other place I go to is the District 91 website. They have a huge section now on competing and judging. I will give you the link later on. But let's have a look at that section because it's really worth considering. Find it. Here we are, competing and judging. So there's this wonderful video webinar that was presented by Neil Coleman when we first started to run online contests, which tells you a huge amount of information about how to proceed if you are organizing the contest. And we've got all this information split between online contests or face-to-face -face contests. You'll note that the online contest list is a lot longer. Um, some of this is just to do with the chief judge, but there's a lot here for the contest chair. You've got a briefing guide for the contestants. There's even a sample email that you can use to send out to the contestants. You've got your script here. You can use this to create your script anyway. 
there's an organization grid. So you, you've even got a way of, I can find it. Here it is. For each of the contests, you can, it gives you a, a way of recording all the people involved in it. You've got virtual timing cards, if you don't have them already. Winner's certificates, participants. Everything you might need, really, to run a contest. So now I'm going to give you a little quiz. Is everybody ready? Do you know your contest rules? It's only a very little quiz. I'd like the answers in the chat, please. So who can compete in the international speech contest? What are the special requirements for that particular contest? I can't actually see the chat here, John. Yes, they're uh, all starting to realise you need level one and level two in pathways to compete. Perfect. So you've not called them out. And just a, a little extra to add to that, you probably want to send a message to each. Uh, when we get to the higher level, certainly, but you need to send a message to each president of a competitor and just remind the president if they haven't updated all the various places in Toastmasters about which speeches those people have done, you might find that your person is ineligible. So please make sure that the contestants remind their presidents or you remind them direct to make sure all the systems are up to date and all the speeches have been recorded otherwise you might find somebody has done the speech it's not on the toast on the system and therefore they're not eligible for the contest thanks very much for that and they certainly need to have it recorded in pathways i'm not sure about because there are two ways of recording um achievements aren't there there's pathways and there is Club Central, and to get your, your DCP points, you certainly have to record things in both. But And Toastmasters International would expect Club Central to be updated. They would. Okay. What else? Sounds like you're all pretty conversant with the rules there. Let's move on to the next one. Who cannot compete in any speech contest? That's a complicated one. I'm going to go back to the contest rule book, but put your ideas in the chat. Oh, somebody's done a cut and paste. Oh, have they? Yeah. Who was that? Christopher. That's cheating. <laughs> Area directors, district officers. Yes, you're all getting the idea. There are certain roles in Toastmasters which would give a perceived unfair advantage and therefore I'm afraid they're not allowed to go in the contest. Anyway, they're busy enough doing other stuff, aren't they? Let the rest of us get in and do the contests. They are. And if you're in any doubt, you can always use the eligibility assistant that's actually on the toastmasters.org website. If you go to Leadership Central, you will find that and it will allow you to check things like membership status, club status and whether that person is a serving district officer. If you are looking at an area contest, you might get your area director to do that. If you're in a division contest, you get the division director to use that eligibility assistant because a club officer only has access to the information for their club. So you can always ask somebody else to look it up if you don't know. But the point is, if you are the contest chair, you're responsible ahead of time for checking the eligibility 
of everyone who takes part in your contest, all of the contestants. So you need to make sure that that person has, is a paid up member and that their club is in good standing and that they're not a serving district officer or someone who could be next year, someone who's thinking of it next year. And the rules are very complicated on eligibility. So please, please have a look at the contest rule book. Can someone compete in more than one area contest? There's, there's a compli slightly complicated answer to this one, but give me your ideas. So there's a suggestion you can be in the contest in different districts. The rule I always used to apply was you couldn't be in two places that would be competing with each other. Yeah. So what it is, it depends what contest you're competing in. You cannot compete at area level and above in more than one area in the same contest. So you, you couldn't compete, for example, in the international speech contest in more than one area. But as I understand it, you can compete in the international speech contest in one area and the evaluation contest in a different area. And I'm pretty sure we've done that in the past. Chris is our district chief judge, if you didn't know. <laughs> Which is why the answer to all these questions is, it's up to Christopher. That's your cop-out answer Read the for rule everything. Book. Yeah. Read, the, Read rule. the rule book. Read the rule book the and then refer to Christopher. <laughs> uh, if, if, if there's any doubt, if there's any, if you're unsure of the interpretation, ask me, but do, do read the rule book first, please. <laughs> How late? Can a contestant arrive and still compete? And this is in the rule book, but you have to look very carefully for it. On. Don't be intimidated because Christopher's here to correct us. I am. Put your, your guesses in. I, am, your guesses in. I struggle to find it actually. I will ask Chris to tell us actually. Chris, you, you know this. Huh? Please, please tell us. I'll find the precise wording, but uh, it's to a first approximation, it's before the contest chair is announced and starts speaking so you can miss the briefing that's fine as long as you waive the briefing and all your paperwork is in order it's before the contest chair steps onto the stage to uh, start the contest thank you that was what i understood um, i i couldn't find it <laughs> And we did that in one contest recently. I did look up the rules in the middle of the contest, the things that can happen in the middle of the contest, and determined that that was the case, that he, the gentleman who was on the train at that time, if he got there before the contest chair started her speech for that contest, he could take part and he did. Who can lodge a protest? And for what reason?
Oh, we got some differences of opinion here now. Oh. Yeah. Some people are saying only judges and contestants. Some people are saying anyone. Some people are saying just contestants. Shall I put you out of your misery? It is only the voting judges, so not the tie-breaking judge or the chief judge, only the voting judges and the contestants who can lodge a protest. And when they lodge that protest, they have to lodge it either with yourself, the contest chair, or with the chief judge. Any update on reasons for a protest? Well, we have the quote of plagiarism. Yeah. Nobody's mentioned way. eligibility, which you may want to challenge somebody for. Yeah. Anything else? There's one that came in quite recently, a couple of years ago, I think. You're not allowed to reference someone else's, some other contestant speech in the same contest. I think it says on the same platform. I'm not sure. You're not allowed to reference another contestant speech because that would give an unfair advantage to the people who spoke later in the contest. So you're not allowed to refer to somebody else's speech. And all of these things, the contestants need to be aware of when you do your briefing ahead of time. Most of the other issues which people think you can have somebody disqualified for are things for judges to bear in mind when they are scoring. Yes, there are some things that might be referred to the judges. But these are the, the three things. There are only the three things on which protests can be lodged. Who decides what to do if there's a technical failure? This is something that can happen in a Zoom contest. Who decides what the rules are and what would happen on the night? It might be a- Okay, we've got a bit of a discussion here. We've got chief judge and contest chair being mentioned. Yeah, it's the chief judge, isn't it? I think. if they're present. You need, would need to refer it to the chief judge and they would need to be actively participating. Am I right, Chris? Yes, you're right. So if, if there's a technical failure of a contest, I mean, if a contestant has a technical failure, chief judge ultimately decides how long to give them to sort that out. I mean, clearly, if, there's a con if the whole thing collapses, then you know, everybody's going to need to um, bounce together and try and sort it out but yeah ultimately the chief judge it's the chief judge's to, at the chief judge's discretion I would suggest that this is discussed and announced to the contestants prior to the contest so that everybody knows what they're thinking but I'm a great believer in trying to ensure that everybody can participate and um, within reason you know for and not exclude people just because and so for example i would suggest but it is a suggestion that a reasonable time might to get back sort out a technical issue is the time it would take to reboot a computer say five minutes um as a sort of baseline and if they look like they're getting back and you don't it's not a one hour lunchtime meeting and you've got a little bit of time then allow people in but it is the chief judge who makes that call. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. How can we be fair to... Uh, uh, and just before we... So uh, I have looked in the rules about competing in multiple areas at multiple districts. The rules, as I read them, I post them in the chat, and I don't want to derail this too, too much, but the rules say no... Contestant can compete in more than one area speech contest of a given type, 
even if the two areas are in different divisions or districts. So that would, you could not compete in evaluation in two different districts is my reading of that rule. You could compete in international speech in one district and evaluation in another? Yes, you could, yes, as long as they're different contest types. Yeah. Uh, and that actually, I think there are, there are six contests. So, so you can compete for different clubs in different districts as long as they are not the same contest at area level and above. Yeah. And at club level, you can compete in as many clubs as you're a member of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. How can we be fair to blind contestants? You must have seen this, some of you, in the contests. But someone who has sight impediment of some sort. What can we do to make life easier for them? Yeah, we've got the answer, verbal cues. Yeah, exactly. We're talking about the time signals, aren't we? So you might have the timer would would speak instead of as well as giving the the um, colored cards, probably they would say green, green, etc. When the time came. OK. Finally, can can two clubs hold a joint contest? It sounds very friendly. Can they do that? There's shaking of heads. <laughs> I can see Pearl shaking her head. <laughs> no, they're not allowed to. They're definitely not allowed to. I've been informed of this by Mr. Walker, so. I thought I'd put that one in there for you. And that's it. That's my little quiz. I'm sure you have lots of other ideas. Um, so let's move on. Common issues. When you're in a contest, when you're the contest chair, plan far enough ahead. Organize everything, get the people organized. Set up your communication lines, do everything that needs to be done ahead of time. Make sure you have your test speaker for your evaluation contest. Really, that's the contest organizer's job, but you will want to be aware, aware of what's going on. Um, yeah, just keep on top of it. Contestant eligibility. I've already spoken about that. If you want to use the eligibility checker, you need to know that person's membership number, which you can put into the eligibility checker, the name and their membership number. So it's a really good idea to get your contestant forms in early. They fill that in on their form and then you can use the checker to make sure you've got everything lined up. Spare functionaries, just in case. You want to know who you've got available on the day if somebody's ill or they just can't get in, can't sign in on Zoom. It's really nice to have, excuse me, somebody who can do any job and fill in. Do the functionaries know their roles? This is something I've come across many times. The timekeeper, the timer. Often they turn up and they don't even know how to use the, the background cards. They don't know how to do it. So what I often do if I'm organizing a contest or I'm the contest chair, I will set up a special little briefing session for the timers even though really it's the chief judge's responsibility for looking after the timers, but I try and save the chief judge that headache because it's such a simple thing to sort out. It's not really about the rules, it's about being able to do the job of, as, as a timer. So, 
and you will of course be responsible for the sergeant at arms as well making sure they know their role and there's some interesting features I, I was in a contest recently where the contest chair asked the contest sergeant arms to make sure that all the contestants hands were in view in the breakout room so they couldn't be playing with their phones <laughs> and and looking at what was going on in the actual contest signing in and on, on a different device allow time for the judges maybe have a break while the judges are deliberating have a backup plan to fill time i've already talked about that have some table topics know what you're going to do in case there's any problems in in the agenda and be kind to the audience give them a chance to speak give them a little cool down session a table topic session at the end because it's a long lonely contest otherwise you, you don't get to speak to anybody you're not even visible for a lot of it in a Zoom contest. You're, you can't hear people, you can't see them. So it's nice to get people involved once the contest is finished. And that's it. Questions. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can actually, and, and maybe we could make people. I don't know, John. Should we make?